Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Series where we add value to people's lives happening every Thursday on ebizradio.com. You can catch the Lunchtime Series on all major podcast channels and in today's marketing and leadership segment, joining me as per usual, marketing and communications expert and co-host Craig Pagely. How are you doing, Craig? Kevin, great. Thank you. Yeah, good to be chatting again after last week's chaotic on the run <laughs> uh, adaptation to find a new topic uh, after the surprise load shedding directly impacted our ability to actually do our uh, scheduled LinkedIn live recording. Uh, it was absolute chaos. But yeah, thanks for selecting uh, an inspiring article last week and for the chance to share some of my uh, thoughts on, on the points in the article on, on the fly. And then just quickly to set some context for our listeners, um, the article was titled Five Leadership Strategies for Thriving in 2020 and was written by Mike Esther Day. He's the CEO of the global sales performance firm Integrity Solutions. And the article was published on Forbes.com, 20 December 2021. And as you noted, you know, really one of your, your favorite resource platforms as well. Yeah, yeah, I I absolutely love I love Forbes. Um, I think it's a it's a, it's a really good go to for for really good content, which is always nice. Um, and thanks for referencing that, Craig, because from my side and uh, to give you some context from my side, the five leadership strategies you ref- referenced in the article was focusing on purpose, lead with a coaching mindset, build a truly customer focused culture, uh, excel at virtual, and finally, uh, rethinking retention and hiring. Um, those five points um, really, really are. I mean, we've been speaking about it for <laughs> for a while now, but that's yes. that sums it up really well. Absolutely. But in in, in the wrap up last week, you actually you gave a, a really wonderful reference to to strategy number two, a leading with the coaching mindset, as your key takeaway from the conversation. Can you just give us a, a bit of a overview as, as as to what it was that that drew you to that? Craig, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> when, when, when we summarized last week, you, you thought that leading with a coaching mindset actually had a, a wonderful encapsulation as, as a key driver across the five leadership strategies. Yeah, so I, I, I think, you know, if, um, for me, on uh, you know, coming from that perspective, what I, what I'm busy with at the moment is, and what I'm picking up in in conversations with a lot of leaders is that uh, a coaching mindset really sets the stage for for people to to have better conversations, um, but also to empower the people they're working with, right? Mm-hmm. To to ask strategic questions, so that you're getting the people you're working with to think. Um, rather than just spoon feeding because, you know, people are lazy. Instinctively, people kind of go, okay, well, just tell me what to do, I'll do it. Um, and, I, you know, we, I don't think that's the future of, of where, where business is heading. Uh, you can't afford that. You can't afford employees to sit back on their laurels and kind of go, okay, well, I'll just wait till you tell me what to do. And then we need, we actively need people to be invested and, and taking, uh, you know, um, initiative to make changes. So definitely, yeah. you know, a big, a big driver for, for coaching, uh, the coaching component in, um, in, in, uh, in business today. But to follow suit, uh, the, your reference strategy number one, focus on purpose as a key takeout. Can you provide us some overview uh, on that point to, uh, to, uh, to the listeners? Yeah, Kevin, thanks. You know, we, we often talk about purpose, or at least you hear me bring purpose into the conversations. And, and really, it's, for me, the encapsulation, I, I believe, of the entire principle of, of, of leadership strategy. And, and really, purpose is the thing that gives you the reason to wake up in the morning and, and gives you that sense of identity. And it's what motivates you and, and, and actually defines what you believe. So, so it definitely stood out for me as the critical uh, uh, um strategy driver in, in this instance. And I think the most important reference always for purposes is always to default back to, to Simon Sinek's golden circle model, which consists of the wonderful, the why, why organizations do what they do, the how, yeah. how organizations do what they do, you know, what, and how it sets them apart from the competitors. And then obviously the what, you know, what, what do they do? What are the products and services that they sell? And, and, and to close on that point, Simon Sinek states that 
why is probably the most important message that an organization or an individual can communicate as this is what inspires others to action, the importance there. So, so start with a why and, and, and it'll show you how to explain your purpose and the reason you exist and behave the way that you do, Kevin. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, just to add, guys, if you haven't seen it before, go and, go and, go and check it out on YouTube. Simon Sinek also speaks to values as verbs. You can actually just type it into YouTube. And that also speaks to the why, right? You, you know, why is this your value? Like, what, <laughs> what are you trying to say when you say integrity is my value? Uh, or um, um, professionalism like why why are you saying it right so i think it's a it's it's a really important point um and that's what we're kind of moving towards today craig we we, we sort of unpacking that what, tell us about what what we are chatting about today yeah kevin so, so i want to expand on the topic of purpose uh, uh, slightly but but this time really focusing on on the concept of shared purpose um and i and, and reason being is i came across a really insightful report titled shared purpose Strong cultures are the foundation of all great brands. Um, the Shared Purpose uh, mini book was published by Brand Culture Company in 2020 and provides a really good in-depth look at how to develop, express, and instill that, that shared purpose. Um, definitely worth a read for, for anybody who's interested in this, this particular proposition. And I want to open the conversation by quoting, I think it's three lines that I came across from the report that really just dreaming into into this concept of shared purpose first is different organizations discuss shared purpose in different ways some claim ownership of a mission others mm. describe their vision or covenant while others articulate purpose or a vision statement second point there is that shared purpose is built around that singular idea the idea that permeates the entire culture of of the organization and then the final quote is is regardless of the nomenclature, shared purpose remains distinct from the taglines and advertising campaigns. And really important to, to, to understand that point when looking at the industry that we actually represent. So let's take a look at a, a few of the leading global brands and, and actually see how they've defined their shared purpose. And I've, I've just picked four from the article. The first is Google to organize the world's information and make it universally, universally accessible and useful. The second is Lexus, and, and I really, I like this, is to treat each customer as we would a guest in our home. The third is Starbucks, we've all heard this one, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And then the last is, is the brand that we all love, Nike. And that is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And what I love about Nike's positioning and, and their shared purpose here is that, you know, if you have a body, you're an athlete. So, yeah, those, those are the four that really stood out for me that, that clearly define what shared purpose is, Kevin. Okay, so, so with an understanding around the, the opening uh, um, quotes of the, the report, let's, let's have a look at a few leading global brands and how they actually define their shared purpose, Kevin, and then taking into account that last point again, that it's not a tagline or an advertising campaign, but it's a statement on their shared purpose. So Google, Google's statement is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Lexus, to treat each customer as we would a guest in our home. Really great statement. Starbucks, one we all know quite well. To inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And then last, the brand that we all love, Nike. To bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And I, and I love the fact that Nike actually expands on this in the sense that they say, you know, if you have a body, you're an athlete. Really beautiful statements of, of intent and, and positioning around the organizations. Craig, just you know, from a, from a marketing and, and and strategy perspective, one of the things that stand out to me is that when it is when it speaks to people, um, and a lot of brands, a lot of successful brands do this, right? When it speaks to people and it really moves uh, the conversation towards people, 
um, it, it's usually quite inspiring what people like what that brand will do, right? Um, and that's the that's the sort of secret sauce to to finding a tagline that that works for your brand. And you know, Kevin, first and foremost, you've got to ensure that the business is structured around the why, and the why demonstrates what the intent and purpose of the brand is. And when you can articulate that. Going back to last week's conversation, the collective of shared purpose in that instance is then bringing the like right-minded people on board, uh, you know, aligning your values to the values of the consumer, the consumer, their values to the values of the organization. The collective of all of that construct brings you to that place of shared purpose and shared value. And and the brands that that really hold themselves true to that are the brands that will excel because people will lean into those brands. And that's the important thing. Yeah. And I mean, because I mean, I'm just thinking about the tagline that I use that, I'm, that I've changed to recently. Uh, and that is, um, we create people solutions. That's it. Right. And, and essentially what it is about is just wanting to create people who are solutions. You know, the solution lies within your people. And that's what we want to be able to develop and create. And so, so interestingly, that that's the core. That's that's the why you do your business. So, in essence, you're you using the tagline as the connector through from the actual shared purpose statement to your business to actually how you're articulating your conversation externally as well, and you signing off for that. And mm -hmm. and in in many instances, what you'll see is the tagline is often associated with a campaign line. So you get your communications framework and then you've got your campaign theme and they often develop theme uh, uh, statements that come out of that as opposed to the foundational statement that describes the intent of the business. Some of that can carry through into the campaign space, um, but inevitably campaigning is seasonal. It's around a, a particular time in the life cycle of the product, et cetera, as well. So those kinds of statements do inevitably change, but the positioning statement articulating out of the shared purpose intent of the business is, is absolutely where it's at. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad that you reaffirming that because for me, when I, when I started thinking of like, what is it or what is it that I want people to see immediately? Um, I don't want to create solutions for people. I want to create people solutions, right? Because the solution, the solution for people would just be an external thing where a people solution is you're working with the people, you're directly involved with those people and they are the solution to whatever you want to do. Right. And the beauty about that is that they, they can then be solutions for so many other things, so much yeah. more, uh, you know, and, and the world needs that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the concentric rings of the circle. And again, if you look at the concentric, three concentric rings of, of you know, Simon Sonic's model as well, that there seems to be a great principle of start in the middle and the rings permeate out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so moving so on to I, the next point here, you have um, appealing uh, part of the appealing part of this article. Yeah, I was just going to jump in there and say, say what, what really stood out for me is the simplicity of this incredible brand platform and culture framework that, that brand culture has developed. And, and what's great is that it, it, it interrogates the aspirations, the values and attitudes and competencies that actually make up an organization. And these are terms that you work with on a daily basis. And, and the brand platform consists of six components, which are noted as follows. So the positioning, which is your promise, uh, it's, it's the relevant, credible, differentiated value that the organization uh, asserts and delivers. The mission, which is the organization's calling and, and what the organization has actually come together to accomplish. The vision, which is that highest aspiration for any organization, is the ultimate impact on the world that the organization will have, the why. Um, the personality, which is the style of the organization, the attributes, the qualities, the traits that actually animate and describe how the organization approaches business. The values, which are your code, the ideas and attitudes that actually collectively define what the organization stands for and the way it works together. And for me, most importantly, describes the behaviors of, of, of the organization. And then the sixth point there is, is the pillars and the strengths and, and you know, the core organizational competencies that actually create and, and ensure that sustainable competitive advantage, Kevin. Great. You know what's interesting is most people speak about positioning mission vision, right? Yes. And values. Values, you know, often come up. 
Well, what people very often forget is personality and pillars, right? <laughs> I'm just looking at this and it's, it's quite significant how those two, because you kind of go, so what is the personality of your brand? It's like, well, I'm not, uh, like, is that defined? Is that kind of, um, and I'll give you a simple um, idea of how, why that speaks so true to me is I, when I started my business, I always like wore a white college shirt and a tie and I would could do the whole thing. Um, and the, the older I'm, and the more I'm sort of settling in my, my, I suppose my, um, I'm just getting older. I think the more I, <laughs> the more I realize that I, you know, what style is style in itself speaks so much about authenticity, right? What is the authenticity of that brand, and how does it come across? Um, and and if it's not defined, um, people might be confused on who they're trying to speak to, right? So I think personality and style is so important. But but I I I, I like that. So pick up on 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 that in, in terms of the. The, the personality and style also sets the tone of the organization and the tone in which it communicates and has conversation both internally and externally. And, and that is a fundamentally important part of, of ensuring that the engagement and connection with the, with the target audience, again, target audience internal and external is, is achieved sustainably. You've got to get the right yeah. speak in place, Kevin. And yes, yeah, the, the, the pillars, you know, what what are the pillars of the business that will enable you to create that continuous sustainable competitive advantage yeah you know and and i think that's also again to the point where where people don't consider that because you know um working with the brands that i currently work with is if you're not asking those questions of what is my differentiating factor your competitor definitely is asking that correct and if correct. you're not it, like it, evolving and create having that constant awareness around what's the next best step forward here what's my next best step and you know that comes from from a coaching kind of approach but also from the, the brand itself right yep. what is my next best step and um you have to be able to ask itself yourself that question for your brand to especially if you're looking at you know what brands are currently doing in in the world and how how quickly things are changing and evolving Right, I, I, today I heard at Builders, Builders Warehouse, to, just today, they said, yeah, no, they, they're getting rid of some of the, the caches so that you can actually go and scan your own things. They'll just have people watch you do it. So you can actually, they want to sort of automate that whole process. The self-checkout conversation so, we've had, yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, yeah, like that's... It's, it's real. It's happening, right? And like, what, what are we doing about it? What, what's the, what, what is your next best step? Uh, as a, as an employee, but also as a leader of, you know, like of business to kind of go, what is my strength? What is, what is my differentiation? How do I, if that's the case, where do I find my next job? What, what am I going to be doing? Yeah. Um, then the interesting thing on that point as well. So that's obviously, you know, a mandate that's come down and Walmart have been incredibly successful in, in, in the self checkout, self help environment. And, and again, you know, I'm sure we'll have riots and, and, and pickets soon <laughs> where individuals are saying that they're not going to have jobs. Well, that's nonsense because redeploy the individuals in a different way in the environment. And when the efficiencies and streamlining is in place and you can get more throughput it at, at the till point, that means that you need to be packing more shelves and bringing more inventory in and you're just creating new skill, upskill opportunities within the organization. But, you know, we've had long conversations uh, uh, around that, Kevin. But Greg, maybe that's what we need. We need visionaries. We need people like you and I to kind of set the tone for people out there to kind of think it through. Because I think people are so get so caught up in the minutia of all the bull, like all the all the crap that's happening in the country and in the world. Like they 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 get bogged down and they don't see the potential like, like future possibility of what could exist. The the reality there, Kevin, is that. Communication is often a key component, and actually we're going to talk about communication in a short while. But in, in building these visions of the future, that, that thinking and speak often doesn't move out of the executive suite and, yeah. and isn't cascaded down into, or if not down, but across the organization. Um, and, and 
that is this entire conversation around shared purpose because when you get to understand the collective think the collective participation the collective decision making there will be collective buy-in there's collective success at the end of the day but when it stays in a box in some kind of hierarchical environment it's never going to get down to the ground and then when it does get to the ground there's going to be antagonism and frustration because they don't understand where it came from and what the benefits of that new technology and implication is yeah i mean i can't agree more craig so we learn from the report that as organizations scale and become decentralized it becomes more difficult to manage direct and expand shared purpose throughout organizations so how do brand cultures see organizations uh, overcoming these challenges? Yeah, Kevin, that's amazing because you just asked the question that you spoke into you know, two minutes ago around <laughs> the fact that the organizations are finding it more, more difficult to manage. And direct. So, so really great, great point there. So the, the six levers that brand culture have identified absolutely help form the foundation of the conversation today and address that and enable us to see how to manage and direct and expand that that purpose. So, so again, to quote from the report, Brain Culture believes that, quote from here, shared purpose must inform both the underlying strategy as well as the company's daily routines. And, and this is achieved by aligning, Kevin, both the external, which is the brand, and the internal, which is the culture of a company around that shared purpose model and drawing on those six distinct levers that can actually bring the cultural framework to life. And, you know, having started with, with that, that key big idea and, and singular idea at, at, at the middle with the, the positioning, personality, vision, values, pillars, uh, components around it, that is your shared purpose uh, uh, framework. But sitting on the outside of that, holding it together, are those six distinct levers, again, of leadership, communications, symbolism, rewards, recognition, and environment. And, and I think it's important just to quickly give a definition of each of those levers um, so, so the audience understand how they will come to play. So the first is, is leadership. And, and leadership is about establishing the priorities and inspiring employers to reach their highest potential. Communication, it's about disseminating compelling and clear information to attract customers and to galvanize the organization culture and activate the brand. And again, in each instance, you're seeing the external and internal reference coming to the fore here. Symbolism, an interesting point here. It's about developing significance in the cultural hallmarks that serve as the touchstone of the organization and those nuances that, that help enable define the personality of the business. Um, rewards and recognition, it's around catalyzing uh, employee engagement and performance through incentives and public acknowledgement. Environments, it's around creating the physical space of an organization to harmonize functional, emotional, and self-expressive needs. And their third lever structure is about establishing the systems and the processes that form the framework for how the organization pursues its, its shared purpose, Kevin. And yeah, you know, it's, it's just fantastic to see how they've been able to articulate it. And that's what I say, this, is, this really is the piece that stood out for me in, in the report. And, and important to note that the development of this cultural framework was actually inspired by a corporate culture pioneer by the name of Dr. Terence Adil. I don't know if you've come across him at all in, in, in your teachings and, and learning. So yeah, Kevin, referencing the article, what are your take on, on, on some of those levers? Craig, um, <clears throat> leadership is a, is a no-brainer, right? You would, you, would, you would think that, you know, leadership obviously need to have uh, and prioritize uh, everything that they're going to be doing in the, in the business. Um, but very often, and I think leadership and communication really go hand in hand. You know, the, when, you, when you start looking at how uh, the culture of a business is formed and um, uh, upheld in any way, um, leadership and communication go hand in hand because if the brand itself doesn't understand or doesn't feel like they, they know what the leaders are doing, um, a culture can re literally li literally uh, disseminate, you know, in, in front of in front of your eyes, kind of thing. Um, what I find really interesting, and this is something I was working with one of my clients just recently, was symbolism, right? So we were doing a very significant culture movement around co unconscious bias, and uh, I thought to myself, how do we how do we then create a symbol for this brand? 
and um, it's something a, a, a dear uh, colleague and, and uh, um, coach that I've actually learned this from was to create a symbol that you can use, you know, uh, when you're actually wanting to convey something quite obviously. And the symbol that we, he, he shared with me was, I'm doing this from my heart to your heart, right? Well, yeah. My heart to your heart. And this is something we used as a symbol throughout the exercise in this culture, the, this, this culture driven program. And you won't believe the impact it has when you're conveying a conversation or you're having a meeting and suddenly you're, you're the symbol that you're starting the meeting with is guys, I'm doing this from my heart to your heart. It immediately prefaces that please understand my intention for this meeting. Please understand how I want this to land, even though it may it might be an uncomfortable conversation, right? So symbolism at any form of what the brand really <laughs> connects to. And I mean, to the point that I'm literally, I'm just thinking now, I'm, I'm actually going to change my, my logo to, to a hat <laughs> because it's... <laughs> It's something that if you see me out in the street, if you see me on camera, half the time I'm wearing a hat, you know, and symbolism in itself speaks to the, the like, it's so important that people immediately, it's like the tick, you know, Nike, it's so obvious that that symbol means just, just do it, you know, like it's, yeah. it's yeah. incredible how that lands, but also um, uh, it, that, that, that rewards and recognition, uh, Craig, I think, um, especially, you know, when you're dealing with culture, again, like that, that whole emphasis on um, what is the one thing that we all as humans have in common, and that is we want acknowledgement. We want to be acknowledged. I, I see you because you are, and you see me because I am. Uh, it's the whole, the whole con concept of Ubuntu, right? Something that half of, the, half of our country has forgotten, right? Um, and yet, it's, it's it's such a core fundamental for a brand, for leaders, for um, for employees to have, right? Yes. Um, that 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 simple acknowledgement of going. Do you know what? I just want to mention, by the way, in the meeting, that we just landed this big contract, and if it wasn't for so and so and so and so, this would not be possible. Yes. Simple yes. recognition like that does wonders, <clears throat> right? Um, you know, it does wonders in a relationship. It does wonders as an employee and as a boss. It, uh, recognition is 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 an absolute key. Um, but I mean, Craig, on these points, on these levers, what what are your what are your take on these levers as well? Yeah, Kevin, it takes a couple of a couple of statements around it. So, so leadership again, it's it's leadership for shared purpose doesn't just mean that that single leader in the organisation creates and communicates the, the vision to everyone. It, it means that the leader should actually lean in and have the collective support to consider everybody's input. And, and the most effective leaders are definitely able to build around that collective sense of shared purpose, Kevin, and, and actually connect each of the individuals to the mission and to, to the larger team. And that's, that's, that's what I really like about it. The communication piece is interesting for me because purpose is, is not something that you just review on your annual strategy uh, sessions. It's something that, that is evident in our daily actions and decisions and, and, and it has to be revisited on a regular basis just to ensure that the calibration and alignment is important and good communication is as an important part of making goals achievable and and for me that's that's really key about communication it it helps define it helps the leader and, and teams actually define what the goals and intent of the organization are as well i think from a symbolism point of view symbolism is a is a, is a wonderful aspect here because it's about in in established organizations it's about heritage and i when i read it i thought of the likes of of kfc and the herbs and spices and the colonel's face and 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 the red bucket and you know for you it is it's about the the hand on heart and passing it on but it's also about do individuals and organizations get names and tags and titles and bring out the nuances and character of of the organization as well and and how how are those 
symbols then used to impact and move the organization forward. And for me, the symbols are also about walking the talk, Kevin. And then, yeah, reward and recognition, motivating the employees, the minutes they're rewarded, the minutes they're motivated, and they're respected for the input, and, and they feel the tangible reward, you know, what's going to happen? You're going to have a positive work environment, no doubt about it. And, and the work environment, I think, is a, is a, is a, it's a great flow onto the concept of environment. Me coming from my uh, architectural, retail, and, and interior background, really environment for me is an incredibly important part of any organization's success. And it's a space where individuals should be made to have a sense of belonging and a, and a connection to, to the work, the organizations, and, and, and the teams that are in place. And then when, when I read that again, it immediately made me think of when we were chatting about Nancy Klein's uh, time to think 10 components of, of a thinking environment. And, and I reviewed them again, and I, and I, and I picked up, I think there were five that, that really spoke to this article as well. So, you know, equality, equality talks, talks to shared purpose. There's no doubt about it. And it's a fundamental part of environment. Appreciation. Both of those are talking to, to rewards and recognition as well, but also environment. Encouragement and information and place. And it's quite interesting to see how those concepts all lean back and come around to, to the central principle of, of shared purpose. And then structure for me in, in, in the context of this conversation took me back to last week again, where we spoke about the, the how. And, and the how in, in the Simon Sinek concentric models is really where, where process happens. And, and shared purpose needs structure because it is the ability to establish the systems, the process, the technologies that actually help build that united organization, Kevin. And, and that's a takeout for me. Quick, uh, quick, quick fact about the brain, right? When, we, when we're dealing with, with, with individuals, uh, what the brain loves is structure and strategy. So the moment uh -huh. you, you, you give the brain some kind of structure, um, people will follow the structure easily, right? Uh, and it, it comes down, I mean, to, in, into layman's terms, literally your brain just functions better when you go and say, okay, cool, this is the structure, this is, the, like, this is what happens first, this is what happens second, and this is what happens third. When you've got that structure, your brain immediately kind of goes, oh, okay, cool, I sort of know what to do. But, it, you know, just so from a human uh, component, <laughs> your brain functions better when you've got structure and strategy, you know, like, so like, it's, it's almost like a no brainer that you can't be without it, you can't be without yeah. structure. Um, because it's 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 it'll be the success of the brand or, or not. Craig, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, it's it's just it's such a wonderful report. This it, it really is because it brings so many of these these components that you and I understand and take for granted in in many instances. It just brings it to an explanation layer that that I think many organisations need to be able to decipher these concepts to this level of clarity and, and push them back into the organization to, to enable those businesses to really get a clear understanding of what this concept of shared purpose is and how all the components and layers really enable them collectively to move together to greater success. Yeah. Guys, and on that note, I'll definitely, I'll make a link for this so that if you want to go and download it, I'll make a link and put it in the description boxes below. Click on it and then go and check it out because it is, it's a, it's an amazing document and it really breaks it down into, to absolute clarity. So uh, Craig, as we end the show today, what are the, the key takeaways that we, that we, we can take away from this conversation? Yeah, Kevin, I just really, you know, close the conversation with a, with a quote from two paragraphs from, from the, the report. Shared purpose is the shorthand, well, not from the report, at least around the concept of, of shared purpose. So shared purpose is the shorthand for people getting connected to the mission of an organization. And the most effective leaders are then able to build a collective sense of shared purpose and connect each individual to the mission of the larger team. And then the final paragraph is, is shared purpose is a clear definition of a value that engages customers, the external, and enlists employees, the internal. And it, at the heart, is the singular idea to engage employees and drive customer preference. And it's simultaneously much simpler 
yet so much more than, than the snappy taglines and positioning statements that, that we spoke about previously. And it tells the world not just what an organization does, but actually why this matters. And again, the why comes up and it convinces customers not just to buy, but actually to believe and in belief, you know, what that brings success. And, and it also helps persuade employees not just to show up, but to step up. So you can see the positive build in every single one of those concepts as well. And yeah, those are the, the key takeaway for this week, Kevin. Great. And, you know, I, for me, again, just to end on a human note, uh, when we don't have purpose, we feel like we don't belong. We, we feel redundant. We feel like there's, there's no point, right? Uh, but when you, when you part of something, um, you have a connection to something, you know? So from a human to human perspective, you suddenly feel like, ah, okay, cool. I belong. I belong somewhere. I'm connected somehow. And when you're not, um, there's this big void. There's this big emptiness, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that. And just to go back to that last line of, of, of the closing paragraph, there is, you know, convincing customers not just to buy, but to believe. Yeah. And persuading employees not just to show up, Kevin, but to step up. And that can only be achieved through the establishment and enablement of shared purpose. Absolutely. Craig, so finally, finally for what do we have in store for next week, next week's conversation? Yeah, Kevin, quite a different conversation for next week. Uh, I want us to have a look at some of the ideas emanating from the Cairns Lions International Film Festival of Creativity that took place on the 20th to 24th of June. There's Fantastic. some really key, there's some really key themes that have, that have come out of that. Um, you know, from, from the likes of the meta to to purpose, to sustainability, and, um, you know, the, the effectiveness of, of creativity. So have a look at that, some, some really great successes and, and award winners there, but just to get you unpack what the themes actually mean for, for the future of, of creativity. Fantastic. Guys, you can, you can join us every Thursday on ebizradio.com at around 12 o'clock. That's the marketing and leadership segment. Craig, thank you so much for joining me, and I will chat to you next week. Thank you, Kevin. Enjoyed today. Thank you.